actually Amber Smith, who did the bulk of the, the work setting everything up. Uh, let's get started and talk a little bit about Central Oregon backyard birds. And then at the end, I want to talk a little bit about uh, something called the Great Backyard Bird Count. Uh, my goal today is to really three th do three things. My goal is to uh, talk to you a little bit about why you might want to attract birds to your backyard. And then I want to tell you a little bit about how to attract, attract birds to your backyard. And then we want to talk a little bit about, as I mentioned, the great backyard bird count that's coming up in a few days. Uh, as for why to attract birds in your, in your yard, um, I think there are two main reasons. One is that that it just adds beauty to your yard. Um, one of the things you can imagine is having a beautiful backyard that's that's static, that's stationary, uh, with no movement, and then suddenly take that same backyard and add uh, a whole bunch of movement and a whole bunch of color. And that's what attracting birds to your yard does. It adds to the beauty and the aesthetics of your backyard. Uh, more importantly, I think, is the, the feeling that it gives you. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to go out in the backyard and just sit with a cup of coffee and watch the birds as they come into my feeders and my water and areas. And uh, it makes me feel great. And I hope that you'll do the same thing. So as for why to attract birds to your backyard, well, I think it just makes you feel better. And, and that's a good enough reason right there. Uh, I thought I might show you some of the things that you might be able to expect uh, in, in, if you do decide to attract birds to your back, backyard. Um, you might be a little bit surprised to find out that there are over 100 different species here in Primeville that you might be able to attract into your backyard or near your house anyway, depending on where you live. Uh, I've shown you two things here. Number one is the table on the left side, and uh, that table is a list of all the birds that I've found in my backyard in Powell Butte. <clears throat> and uh, if you look down at the bottom, that total number is 127. So in 30 years of living in Powell Butte, and I live in kind of a, a dry natural area with junipers, I found 127 different birds over the years in my backyard. That's pretty impressive, but uh, actually I have a friend who also lives in Powell Butte. Her name is Cindy Zelenardo. And she has a big backyard, but also has a big pond in that backyard, which attracts a lot of waterfowl. She has the largest list that I know of, of anybody that keeps track of all the birds in her yard. And her list right now is 162, if you can believe it. Uh, birds that have visited her yard just in the last 10 years that, that she's lived there. So the possibilities are pretty big and uh, you might be able to find even more birds in your backyard. I uh, would like to show you a little bit about some of the variety of birds that you might see. Uh, I want to tell you some of the names of these birds. My goal is not to have you learn the birds. There are too many of them to learn. Uh, but people are curious about what the names are, so I'll do my best uh, to go through them as I do uh, talk about them and, and tell you what their names are. Uh, you can find a lot of different color varieties, and I'll go over some of those in a second. Um, here we have six birds that uh, represent some of the different colors you might be able to add to your backyard. The first bird in the upper left is a Rufus hummingbird. The bird in the upper center is a mountain bluebird. Uh, the bird in the upper right is western uh, tanager. And down in the bottom left is eve evening grosbeak. And uh, bottom center is the western bluebird. Bottom right is a Cassin's finch. And all of these birds were pictures were taken in, uh, like most of the pictures in this presentation, were taken in my backyard. So what kind of colors can you add to your yard? And, and the answers are lots of different colors. There are different bluebirds you might get. The uh, top bird on the left here is a mountain bluebird again. Top center is a Stellar's jay. A lot of people call this a blue jay, but we don't actually have blue jays very often in Oregon. Um, this bird is the native blue jay that we have, and people call it a blue jay, but it's actually called a Stellar's jay. Uh, the upper right-hand bird is a beautiful bird called a Lazuli bunting. Uh, down below on the left, you might recognize this bird. It's a pretty common bird in Primeville called the California scrub jay. And bottom right, if you live out in the junipers, you might have something called a pinion jay. So a lot of different blue birds that you might be able to find. There are also red birds that can come to your yard. Uh, our upper left-hand bird here is the house finch. And uh, the middle bird on the top side is a red crossbill. Notice that crazy looking bill that it has. That bill is designed to cram the bill into a, a pine cone and uh, open its mouth and it pops the pine seed right into the mouth of the bird. So it feeds on pine cones uh, and you can get, and it will, it will come to bird feeders to feed on other seeds as well. Upper right-hand bird is the uh, 
red-breasted sapsucker. Uh, down on the left, the bottom left again is the rufous hummingbird that's a red bird, and then a Cassin's finch that we mentioned before. We can also find lots of yellow birds in the yard. Uh, the most common yellow birds we have are warblers, and the upper center bird is a Wilson's warbler, just as an example. But we have about seven different kinds of warblers. You'll see some of them a little bit later on. The over on the left hand side, the top bird is a uh, western tanager female, she, who's yellow. Uh, at the on the left side, at the bottom is uh, the Oregon State bird, the western meadowlark. In the very center of the slide is the American goldfinch, and below that is its cousin, the lesser goldfinch. And then the upper right hand corner, we have the yellow headed blackbird and uh, uh, evening grosbeak on the bottom right. So lots of yellow birds that you can attract to your yard. There are orange birds. Uh, up over on the left hand side at the top are two, uh, two swallows. The top bird is a cliff swallow and the bottom bird is a barn swallow. And the center is probably the most common bird in the Ochoco Mountains year round but it does come down into bird feeders as well. It's called the red-breasted saps, or excuse me, the red-breasted nuthatch. And um, up top right, you might recognize that bird. That's the American robin, one of our more common birds. Another bird in the center on the bottom that people often mistake for a robin is called the spotted towhee, uh, but it has a white belly instead of an orange belly like the robin does. And then the orangest of all of our orange birds is the Bullock's Oriole, which is on the bottom right-hand corner. We, we get that bird in your yard in the summertime. We even have a lot of blackbirds that will come to your bird feeders and come to your yard. Um, top left over here is the uh, turkey vulture. Now, you don't think of turkey vulture as being a yard bird or a backyard bird, but in the spring, uh, when they first arrive, uh, they do roost in tall trees in Primeville. Uh, now, you don't want to park your car underneath the, that kind of a roost because you're going to get a new paint job in the morning if you do. Uh, but uh, they do come to your yards on occasion, and you can see them from your yard quite often. In the very center of the slide is the Brewer's Blackbird, our most common blackbird, and you can find this bird in town all the time. Uh, if you would like to find one, you can go to McDonald's parking lot just about any day, and you'll find Brewer's Blackbird. Up in the upper right is the Red Wing Blackbird. A lot of people are familiar with the song of this bird and also the Red Wings. Uh, it's usually found in marshy areas. If you have some cattails near your yard, you can find it there. Uh, bottom right bird is an American coot. If you happen to have a little pond in your yard or near your yard, then you might be able to get that bird. And the bottom center is a juvenile uh, common raven. Uh, common, generally, ravens aren't found in town very often. Um, gen the general rule is crows are found in town and ravens are found out in the country. There are lots of exceptions to that rule, but uh, if you live a little bit out in the countryside, you might get ravens in your yard. And finally, on the bottom left is a red-tailed hawk. Now, red-tailed hawk comes in a lot of different colors, and one of the color phases is almost black, like this bird. Uh, so, And they, they like to nest in, in tall, deciduous trees, so if you have tall trees in your yard, you could get a red-tailed hawk. And then occasionally you get some crazy white birds and white birds are not very common in nature. Uh, but what does happen is occasionally there are birds that have genetic problems. You might be familiar with albinism as a genetic problem. Uh, a more common genetic problem in birds is called leucism, where they are partially albino, not the entire bird. You can tell the difference between leucistic birds and uh, albinistic birds. Uh, albinos always have bright pink eyes, and that's because they have no color pigment in their eye. And all you see are the little capillaries that make the eye turn pink. None of these four birds have pink eyes, so they're not albinos, but they are partial albinos, what we call leucistic birds. Uh, and it happens quite often in birds. Um, it, it's pretty striking when you see one. Uh, the bird in the upper top left is uh, a brewer's blackbird, it's supposed to be jet black, but it's almost white in this particular individual. On the left at the bottom is an American robin with some leucistic properties. Another American robin, a different bird uh, on the upper right-hand corner uh, shows you that leucistic birds don't always look the same. And then uh, just the other day I was uh, roaming around and I found a leucistic ringneck pheasant. That's the bird on the bottom right. And so you never know what's going to show up in your yard that's a crazy white bird. 
Um, I would like to make the point that that uh, one of the advantages of drawing birds into your yard is that that you will get seasonal changes in the birds that do visit you. It's not always the same birds all the time. Uh, you'll have different birds in the winter. You'll have different birds that come in, in spring migration, then different birds that stay in your yard to nest in the summertime, and then also different birds again when the fall migration happens. So let's take a look at some of those guys. Uh, we have some year-round residents that you're likely to find in your yard. Uh, upper left-hand corner is a western screech owl. That picture was taken just a couple of months ago in uh, Powell Butte. Um, a very common yard bird year-round in your yard would be the center left bird, which is a mountain chickadee. The bird in the very center of the slide is the most common woodpecker we have, the hairy woodpecker. It's called a hairy woodpecker because it has little hairy-like bristles at the base of its bill. Upper right-hand corner bird is a, a cute little one of our smallest birds called a bush tit. Usually uh, we find bush tits in, in uh, flocks of 30 and 40 sometimes that will come into your feeders, so they're fantastic. Uh, our most common feeder bird of all is the house finch, which is the bird that's in the center on the right, the little red bird. And then along the bottom here, we have uh, uh, California scrub jay on the left. And again, lesser goldfinch and American robin, these are all things that are very common year round birds in your yard. There are more, I'll go through them fairly quickly. Uh, one of the most abundant birds in, in North America is the upper left, the house sparrow. It's typically found in town and you probably have them near your yard if you're uh, feeding birds at all. Uh, American crow is not a terribly common bird in Primeville. That's the bird on the left in the middle. Uh, but we do have a few American crows in town. And uh, in the very center, um, you'll be, you would be surprised if you went out and looked at, and listened at night how many great horned owls there are uh, in the general area around Primeville. Uh, it's a very common bird. It's by far our most uh, common owl, the great horned owl. It's also the heaviest owl in North America. <clears throat> on the center right is a Eurasian collar dove, and in the bottom left is the morning dove. These are the two different kinds of doves that we can attract uh, in our yard. And um, you can also get some rock pigeons, but that's a little less common. Uh, in the center and the bottom is the California quail, and most people know about quail. If you start feeding birds in your backyard, you're likely to get quail. And I mentioned uh, that the house sparrow was the second most common bird in North America. The most common bird in North America is actually the European, European starling in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide that we have year round. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about how to track birds to your yard. And I'm gonna talk also a little bit about how not to attract the starlings and the house finches because they are a bit of a problem. Neither of those birds are naturally found here in the prime blue area or in North America. We have birds that visit us only in the wintertime. Most of the time, most of these birds spend the summer up in the far north and then they, or in the high mountains. And then they come down to our bird feeders and our uh, backyards in the wintertime. The upper left bird is a varied thrush. People confuse it with a robin, but it has a black mask and a, a black necklace. It's a gorgeous bird. The center bird on the top is called the dark-eyed junco. And dark-eyed juncos are often called snowbirds because they're some of the first birds to come to your feeders in the wintertime. Uh, and and the, their arrival means it's wintertime here in Primeville. So uh, learn the dark-eyed juncos, you'll, you'll know when it's winter. Upper right-hand corner is a merlin, which is a little falcon that comes in only in the wintertime here, spends the summer uh, up in the boreal forests of Canada. And bottom left is a golden crowned sparrow that only comes during the cold months between generally November and March, uh, for and then it goes north after that. Uh, I, the middle bird on the bottom is a ruby crown kinglet, and the bird on the bottom right we mentioned before is the spotted towhee, which can actually be found year round in your, in your yard, but is more common in the winter time. And then we have migrants and, the migrants come in in the spring from Mexico usually, or from as far as South America, and they generally pass through our yards or sometimes stay and nest in the yard as well. All of these five birds are warblers. Uh, and warblers are common migrants that we get uh, in, in the yard in the springtime and a little bit in the fall when they return as well. Uh, upper left-hand bird is a yellow warbler. The center bird is a yellow rumped warbler. The upper right-hand corner bird is a, is a Nashville warbler. 
Uh, bottom left is orange crown warbler. You can't quite see the crown on that bird, but it has little orange stripes. Sometimes it shows. And the bottom right bird is a McGilvery's warbler. And then more mi migrants that come in the spring, uh, the calliope hummingbird in the upper left is the smallest bird in North America. Uh, and it nests in the Ochoco Mountains, but will come to your bird feeders, your hummingbird feeders in the spring and the fall. It's, it's moving to and from the Ochoco Mountains. Uh, upper center bird is a, a bird called a vireo. This is Caston's vireo. And then upper right-hand corner is a black-headed grosbeak. They also nest in the Ochoco's, but come to your feeders in the spring. In the center is a warbling vireo, a common migrant. Uh, bottom right is the gorgeous Lazuli bunting. And bottom center, as we mentioned before, is the red-winged blackbird. And bottom left, one of my favorites, is the western tanager. And they, the western tanagers come in pretty good waves through Prineville uh, in the springtime in May. And if you keep your eyes open, you can see this gorgeous yellow and black and uh, red bird. Uh, we also have some birds that only visit us or regularly visit us in the summertime. Uh, and generally, they'll visit your yard in the summertime because they've been able to find some kind of nesting situation in your yard. The upper left-hand bird here is an American kestrel. And if you have an, an old woodpecker hole in your yard or something like that, that's what they nest in. The center bird is an ash-voted flycatcher that generally nests in juniper trees. So if you have junipers, you might be able to get that bird. The upper right-hand bird is very interesting. It's called the Swainson's hawk. And Swainson's hawks migrate all the way from as far as Argentina in South America up here in the springtime to feed on sage rats uh, in central Oregon. Uh, but they like to nest in tall deciduous trees. So they'll feed out in the country, but they'll come to your yard and nest in your backyard sometimes. Uh, the bottom left bird is a house wren, our most common summertime wren. And on the bottom right is a killdeer, which you don't think very much of uh, a killdeer being a backyard bird, but killdeer like to lay their nests in gravel. So if you have a long gravel driveway, sometimes a killdeer will, will uh, bless you with its presence anyway and, and nest in your driveway uh, as long as you don't run over it. And then sometimes you just get some rare birds. One of my favorite things about feeding birds in my backyard is that it brings birds that you don't typically uh, get to see in Central Oregon very often. Uh, they're rare, so they don't happen very often, uh, but they do happen on, a, on occasion. The, the bird in the upper left was actually along Ochoco Creek uh, a couple of winters ago. It's called a Harris's Sparrow, a uh, pretty rare bird in Central Oregon. The bird in the center is called a, um, a common red pole, and I took this picture actually out of Polina, but we have had common red poles feeding on birch trees right here in Primeville. Uh, upper right-hand corner is a uh, white-throated sparrow, and they'll come into your bird feeders every once in a while. Sparrows are fairly common at your bird feeder, but this is a very rare sparrow to get. So watch for that bright white throat and yellow patches near the eyes. The bottom right bird looks like some of the other red birds, but this is uh, called the purple finch. And we get a lot of finches at our bird feeders, but purple finches is a little bit unusual. It prefers to eat fruit rather than seeds, although it will eat some seeds. And so if you have a crabapple tree in your yard, it's possible that uh, you could get some purple finches. And then the bottom left-hand bird is a rare bird that I found actually in my yard. Uh, this is called an American red start. This is a female. The males are orange and black and gorgeous. But um, this is one of the first times that this bird was one of the first times it's been seen in, in uh, Crook County in the last 40 years, was in my yard just last year. Okay, let's talk a little bit about attracting birds to your yard. We, we, we saw that you can attract some beautiful birds to your yard. Let's see how you do it now. And I like to, to tell people, uh, I like to kind of mess up the quote from Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams. It said, uh, if you build it, they will come. Well, I, I tell people, if you feed them, they will come. If you feed the birds, they'll come to your backyard. And so I want to talk a little bit about how to, to feed birds. Uh, in this particular uh, montage here, we have uh, some bird seed feeders on the left. Uh, you can tr plant uh, different plants that have fruit and produce seeds like the mountain ash on the top and the uh, birch catkins on the bottom there. And that will help bring birds into your yard. And then you can hang hummingbird feeders and get the hummingbirds to come in. Speaking of hummingbirds, uh, we get about four different kinds of hummingbirds in general here in the Primeville area. Uh, the 
by far the most common hummingbird we get is the rufous hummingbird in the bottom right, little red guy. The female is actually green. Uh, and hummingbirds, generally, the females are different colors than the males. Uh, but we also get a black chinned hummingbird in the upper right. Uh, generally get that bird in the spring, uh, but sometimes in the summertime as well. Uh, and then we get the beautiful Anna's hummingbird in the upper left. And that's a, this is a crazy bird here because this is a bird that feeds on nectar and insects. And yet it, a few of them winter every year in Primeville. And they, they keep their, uh, their, their selves alive by trying to find uh, hummingbird feeders and uh, insect eggs to feed on during the winter time. Uh, but it's amazing this little tiny uh, summer type bird can make it all the way through a primeville winter. And then in the bottom left, I mentioned before, the smallest bird in North America is the calliope hummingbird. And uh, that bird generally comes into our feeders in hummingbird feeders in uh, the uh, spring and the fall. Uh, a lot of people ask questions about how to uh, put out hummingbird feeders. And, and before I get into uh, the mixture itself, uh, I would like to stress that we want to keep our all our bird feeders as clean as we can, clean them often. Uh, hummingbird feeders should be cleaned uh, at least once a week if you can. Uh, and it just uh, it prevents spreading diseases and uh, it prevents the, the hummingbird feed itself from going bad and damaging and harming the birds. Uh, mixing up hummingbird feed is very simple. You simply use the formula one part sugar and four parts water. So if you're going to have, make up a big batch, you might put one cup of sugar in a, in a container, four cups of water, mix it up really well, and then pour that into the, uh, the hummingbird feeder. And if you have any excess, you can store that in your refrigerator and use it the next time when the hummingbird feeders uh, start to run out. There's a little bit of controversy as to whether you should use, excuse me, use uh, uh, red dye in your bird feeders. Um, the research is a little bit mixed on that. The, my main point is there's no point in doing it. It doesn't attract more hummingbirds. Uh, hummingbirds are pretty smart about spotting hummingbird feeders that are that are not red. So that's not really the, all that important. So I don't see any reason to introduce a dye if you don't have to. So I do all, I just simply put uh, sugar and water in my hummingbird feeders and they do just fine. Let's talk a little bit about bird seed. There's some general rules that I want to go over. Um, and again, this is important to keep your bird seed feeders clean as it is your hummingbird feeders. Uh, we have a, a really common disease that spreads through uh, contact of bird seed feeders uh, called conjunctivitis. And it causes the eyes of these birds to swell up and it's, it's really nasty for them. They tend to starve to death when they get that disease. So keep your bird seed feeders clean. There are a number of different styles of, of bird, feed, uh, bird feeders, and it doesn't really matter that much which style you use. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the upper left-hand corner, a sort of a platform feeder, uh, can be rated pretty easily by squirrels and deer. So I tend to stay away from that platform feeder, uh, that kind of that style of feeder. Where where I am, where I have deer, it's kind of a problem. Uh, the center feeder is like a little birdhouse kind of a feeder, and that's fine, works just about fine. And the bottom right hand feeder is uh, a tube feeder. That's the most common kind of feeder, and probably the best as far as not wasting seed or having uh, other animals take advantage of your bird seed. So um, you know, use your bird feeders. You buy whatever you uh, feel like you can, or you can build your own. Now, we have two main rules in, in feeding birds, bird seed. And rule number one is black seeds in the air and yellow seeds on the ground. Black seeds, uh, as I'll go over here in a second, um, are very attractive to birds. And black seeds uh, but are, uh, are fed to birds that uh, like to feed while perched in the air or while perched on a branch or something like that. So uh, black seeds need to go in the air, but yellow seeds need to go on the ground. One of the most common bird feeder mistakes people make is they put yellow seeds in the air in a bird feeder, and you simply waste those yellow seeds. Some birds like to feed on the ground. Some birds like to feed in the air. It just turns out that the birds that like to feed on the ground prefer yellow seeds. The birds that like to feed in the air prefer black seeds. If you mix those up, then you're going to have fewer. It's not that you won't have any birds, but you're going to have fewer different kinds of birds uh, if you if you take that strategy. So rule number one, black seeds in the air, yellow seeds on the ground. Rule number two, avoid these seed mixes. So if you look at that bird feeder on the bottom right, 
Uh, you'll notice that there are some black seeds in there, which are great for in the air, but there are also a bunch of yellow seeds in there that are not so great for in the air. And then, worst of all, you'll see there's some red seed in there. And really, that red seed is not very attractive to any of our Central Oregon birds. And so the birds tend to just spit those out. And so you're paying money when you buy mixed seed uh, for seeds that the birds typically won't eat uh, or they don't like to eat anyway. And you're not going to attract as many birds with mixed seed as you will if you simply put black seeds in the air and yellow seeds on the ground. So uh, avoid those uh, bird mixes whenever possible. There is one exception I'll get to in just a little bit, uh, little bit later. But uh, avoid those seed mixes and put black seeds in the air and yellow seeds on the ground and you should do just fine. Well, I talk about black seeds. The most important black seed is black oil sunflower seeds. Uh, these guys attract more birds uh, than any other seed that you can buy. Uh, if you're gonna feed one seed, feed this one. Uh, and remember, black seeds in the air, so this seed doesn't go on the ground. It goes in bird feeders in the air. Uh, I will caution you a little bit on the bottom left, I put it in a picture of, of these giant sunflower seeds. Uh, those are not as attractive to birds because some of them uh, the, the seed is actually too big for them to eat. So use small black sunflower seeds and buy, and please be sure, never use salted sunflower seeds that you buy in the store uh, for human consumption. Uh, that will kill the birds, so you don't wanna do that. Another black seed is called Niger thistle seed. Uh, it's a very small seed that you put in a specialized thistle feeder, but uh, it, it attracts a certain group of birds that are, are pretty wonderful. Uh, you might uh, check out this slide and see uh, if you put up a bunch of thistle seed, you might attract this kind of gold to your yard. So you can imagine how that would add to the aesthetics of your yard. Uh, Black Niger thistle seed, very good for attracting goldfinches. These are goldfinches and, uh, and other yellow birds as well. And on the next slide, then we talk about yellow seeds on the ground. Well, what kind of yellow seeds are we talking about? Well, Probably the best seed that's yellow, but it's also the most expensive seed is the millet on the upper left there. And that's a very high uh, protein and high energy uh, seed for birds. A little bit more expensive, but if you can afford it, then that's the best seed to, to feed on the ground. Um, the bottom, bottom upper right uh, are, you can also add whole grains if you have things like uh, whole grains and legumes, by the way. Uh, if you have something like wheat or barley or oats, uh, then you can spread that along the ground and that's just fine too. Birds uh, really love those natural uh, whole grains like that. Uh, and then unsalted peanuts, you can add to that if you want to. The jays love those in particular, uh, if you want to track those guys to your yard. Uh, I mentioned before that one of the uh, exceptions to the rule of not buying mixed seed, uh, I was going to talk about that and that's uh, the center picture. Um, you can buy uh, what it's called hen scratch or chicken scratch in some bird places. If you go to uh, a feed store uh, that, that's selling chicken feed uh, and you buy the hen scratch, it's actually a mixture of yellow seeds, but it's all good yellow seeds. And so that's the one exception about the whole mixture rule. Uh, you, can you can feed chicken scratch and, and get away with mixing the seed. In fact, uh, chicken scratch is designed to be very healthful. Uh, to young chickens, and so they're good for natural birds or wild birds as well. You can also add suet. Uh, if you don't know what suet is, suet is uh, sold in little bricks, and it's a combination of bird seed and, and uh, animal fat. And it's a very high energy, um, high fat uh, content food that's very attractive to birds. Birds, in a lot of times, will prefer suet to almost anything else because of the high energy content. Um, you typically buy them in little little packages on the bottom left. You can see an example of this. You can get them in any bird store uh, or any uh, feed store. Uh, and you just simply take those out of the package and stick them in these little wire containers. And birds love it, especially woodpeckers if you want to attack, attract them to, to your yard. So after you've taken care of their food ned needs, then uh, consider a couple more things that you might be able, able to use to attract birds to your yard. Uh, one thing is to provide them some place to nest. And a lot of people hang up uh, bird houses, which I encourage you to do. Uh, it's just a lot of fun to be able to walk out or working in your garden and look out and watch a, a little bird raising a family in the birdhouse in your yard. 
a couple of rules here is if you're going to put up a birdhouse, you can build your own. I'll give you a, a little bit about that on the next slide. But but often you can just buy these at the, at again at at bird stores or at uh, feed stores where they sell bird feed. Um, it's important that you try to keep the the hole in the bird feeder under an inch and a half. And that's because uh, if it's more than an inch and a half, then the European starling can get in there and, and starlings are very aggressive and they'll run out all the natural birds. And remember European starling is an invasive species that was introduced in the 1900s, uh, early 1900s. And uh, it's it's been a real problem ever since then, but it's a problem that's not gonna go away. So you need to try to keep them out of your bird feeders and you can do that by keeping the hole small enough that they can't fit in there. Uh, so you still have a problem with, with house sparrows nesting in your bird houses. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do about that, but uh, at least you can keep the starlings out. Uh, again, on the bottom left hand, I'd like to draw your attention. Make sure you that you keep these birdhouses clean. It's essential that you clean out the birdhouse every fall. It doesn't have to be in the fall. It can be in late, late summer, but you're safer if you wait till fall because then the birds for sure won't be nesting in there. And so you need to buy a birdhouse or build a birdhouse that has a door that will open that you can clean out. If you don't clean out the birdhouse, then two things happens. Um, one is that, that that over a couple of seasons, as the birds build more and more nests in there, they will add nesting material every time and they'll fill up the box and then it becomes useless. The second problem is that every time they build a nest, parasites begin to grow in the nest. And when you put two nests in one box, then you have twice as many parasites. If you put three nests in a box, well, I don't need to keep going, but uh, you have to clean these things out to keep the parasite load from destroying the babies inside the birdhouses. You can build your own birdhouses. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this very much because all you have to do is go online. There are a million different uh, styles, but again, number one, make sure that you pay attention to that nest hole size and do some research on what kind of birds you wanna attract. And then uh, also make sure that it has a, a door opening to be able to clean out the box. And if you do that, then you can probably attract at least some of these birds to your yard. American kestrels in the upper left um, are, are uh, nesters that you might be able to get. Uh, tree swallows are pretty common. If you put up birds houses uh, and you live with a, uh, an open area somewhere, you can often get tree swallows there. Uh, the the uh, Primeville Bird Club has a giant tree swallow uh, project out at the Crooked River wetlands where we have 200 or almost 200 uh, tree swallow boxes out there. And last year, over half of those were full. So you have a pretty good chance that you can get tree swallows if you put up a box. Upper right-hand corner is a flicker, our, our most common woodpecker, and it'll nest in, in tree houses or bird houses. And again, the house wrens will come in and the bottom, uh, both of the bluebirds will nest in bird houses if you put them up. And uh, even if you get lucky, you can get a Western screech owl like the bottom right. In Central Oregon, uh, you're probably uh, as likely to attract birds to your yard with water as with seed or with food. Uh, water is a, a limiting factor here in Central Oregon because we sort of live in the desert. So add water to your yard and you're going to simply double your chances of getting birds into your yard. So it's a good idea. And you can use little bird baths or you can build an entire water feature like down at the bottom right hand corner. That's up to you. So what else can we do? Uh, to attract birds to our yard, we'll look at a couple of things. One of the things you can do is you can create a, a brush pile. Uh, in my backyard, this is not my brush pile, but in my backyard, I have a big brush pile made by tree branches. And brush piles are very popular with birds. Mine's full all the time. And the biggest reason is because uh, the small birds can get away from predators by jumping to the center of a brush pile like this. A large hawk that comes in to eat a sparrow can't get to the sparrow if the sparrow can get down inside there. And even birds like California quail, well, I have quail in my brush pile every day uh, because it's a safe place for them to go uh, if uh, a predator's nearby. You can add a place, oops, we don't have pictures here. Uh, anyway, you can provide a place for the birds to perch by just adding a couple of, um, a couple of uh, places for them to perch like uh, uh, spare branches or naked branches or dead branches or something like that near the bird fever, 
feeder. It allows them to um, uh, it allows them to find a place to perch and look for predators before they come to the feeder. They'll be more comfortable, which means you'll get more birds. Another thing you can do is keep your cats indoors. It's uh, probably the number one human caused threat to uh, small birds in, in North America are feral cats. And uh, some estimates have more than a billion birds killed every year by feral cats. So we ask you to keep your cats inside whenever possible, and uh, that'll help us save the birds and track more birds to your yard, your yard. And if you do all those things, then what can you expect? Well, you can expect lots of different kinds of beauties. There's supposed to be a picture here, but it didn't come through for some reason. And you can also get the beasts. So people ask me all the time, how do I keep uh, hawks and, and other raptors from coming into my bird feeder? And I answer, well, you don't. You know, they're, they're coming in for food just like everything else. It's all part of nature. Uh, you sort of have to live with that. And sometimes it's a little bit brutal, but uh, we try to discourage people from keeping the raptors away from their bird feeders because you're feeding those birds as well. Okay, uh, to end this pre presentation, I wanna talk a little bit about the great backyard bird count. Now this is a, a count that happens every year. Uh, it's sponsored by Cornell University. It was developed originally by Cornell. Uh, and, and then uh, they gathered additional uh, sponsors, the National Audubon Society, the Birds of Canada, which is sort of the National Audubon Society of Canada, and uh, uh, a little organization called eBird, which I'll talk about in a second. And all those guys together sponsored this worldwide count that uh, is actually a true global event where, where you go out and count the birds in your backyards or near your yards. Uh, and you enter those birds online and then they get a final count and so we get an idea of what, how many backyard birds we have in the world every year, and, and we can track that. Now, we tend to think of, of tracking bird numbers as a scientific kind of thing that scientists must do, but the reality is um, bird science is not a, a high-paying job, and there's not very many bird scientists out there doing it, and there's certainly not enough to, for us to get a really good idea of bird populations throughout the planet. That's done by citizen scientists like you and I. And, and you can part of the things you, one of the things you can do is to participate in this great backyard bird count. The bird count this year is between February 12th and February 15th. You can count any one of those days. You can count all of those days. You can count for uh, only 15 minutes and enter your birds if you like, or you can count all day, anything in between. Uh, and I'll show you how to, to enter those birds and, and take care of that data. So uh, let's take a look at how that happens. Uh, let's say you want to participate in the great backyard, you know, sorry, the great backyard bird count. Uh, and if you do, what do you have to do? Well, uh, you go to this slide and you do a couple of things. The first thing you have to do is you have to sign up for something that's called eBird. And eBird is an online bird data entry uh, platform, which sounds kind of crazy and hard and scary, but it's actually pretty easy. Uh, you sign up, you go up online, you search for eBird on Google, and or you just go to ebird.org and it will walk you through on how to sign up and create an account. The account is free. Uh, if you use your, your desktop, again, you just go to ebird.org, but if you're gonna use your phone, and I will tell you that the phone is much easier than, than doing it on the desktop. Um, if you sign up on your phone, you can go to, the, to your app store, either the, the iPhone app store or whatever Android platform you're using. Go to your app store, search for eBird, download the app, and then you have to install it and, and sign up and, and set up an account. All this takes 30 minutes or so, but once you're done, then you only have to do it one time ever, and you'll be signed up for eBird for the rest of your life if you want to. Uh, and then what do you do? Well, you just go out and you count birds for at least 15 minutes. And if you don't know particular birds or if, you, if you're not very good at, at identification, I'll get to that in just a second. But you go out in your backyard, or you go out in a place near your house, or you can actually do it anywhere and count birds for 15 minutes or longer. You have to do a minimum of 15 minutes. And then you enter those birds in on your eBird app on your phone or on your desktop. And, and then that's it. It's easy pretty much as one, two, three. Uh, you sign up, you count the birds and you enter the birds. And that's pretty easy. Uh, what if you're a beginner and you don't know how to identify birds? Well, eBird has supplied a bird ID app on, and that you can also uh, download on your phone. It's called the Merlin Bird ID app. 
and you can search that uh, on the web or you can just go to your app store again and uh, type in Merlin bird ID and you can download that app. It's very easy to use as well. It just has you sort of describe the bird that you're looking at and then it gives you see either some pictures or an actual idea. And then you can also just snap a little picture with your phone and send that to Merlin and it will tell you what the ID is and, and, and helps you out. So people with a lot of experience or people with virtually no experience can participate in the great backyard bird count. And in the, uh, the uh, great backyard bird count of 2020, I just uh, gathered up some numbers from last year. Uh, there were about 268,000 people that participated around the world last year. They counted 27 million birds and about 7,000 different kinds of species in 194 countries. So we're making a difference. We're, we're actually getting information that's essential and important worldwide to find out about bird populations. So I encourage you to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count uh, coming up just in a few days. Uh, before I go, uh, I have to do my shameless plug for the Primeville Bird Club. Uh, I'm the leader of the Primeville Bird Club and we have uh, regular monthly meetings. At least we did before COVID came along and, and once COVID goes away, then we'll go continue those meetings. We're not currently meeting, but when we do meet, we meet every second Thursday of the month uh, at the Crook County Library. Doors open at 6.30 and we have uh, generally a social time between 6.30 and 7. And then we have uh, our, our general program. We take care of a little bit of business. We discuss local birds and then we have an evening program of some kind uh, each time. So if you're interested in, in birds locally and you want to join the, the Primeville Bird Club, uh, the best thing to do is to drop me an email. My email address is at the bottom of this uh, uh, slide. And I'll also probably post that uh, my email address uh, when we post this YouTube video. So that's the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for sitting through all of this. I hope you enjoyed some of the bird pictures that you saw, and I hope you try to attract some birds to your yard. Um, well, I would like you, if you have questions, to leave those questions in the comment section down below the, the uh, YouTube video, and I'll try to get back to you and answer your questions whenever I can. And again, I encourage you to join the Primeville Bird Club and participate in the great backyard bird count. Thank you very much.